If you've ever wanted a comprehensive write-up of all of the timelines of of studies on gender-affirming care for trans youth, well, Julia Serrano has us covered. This is a an article on her Medium page. Julia Serrano is um, talking about how basically, like, she did this and she did all of the work to comp to compile all of the data so that we would have access to it in one location, which is amazing. Let's see. Okay, so thank you, Julia, for pointing out gender-affirming healthcare has a long history. First trans-related surgeries were carried out in the 1910s to 1930s. While some doctors were supportive early on, most were quite wary. Skeptical doctors subjected trans people to all sorts of alternate, alternate treatments, such as perpetual psychoanalysis or aversion and electroshock therapies, and also administering assigned sex-consistent hormones. Like, for example, if you are assigned male and you believe you are a woman, they would give you testosterone to try to like make you not want to be a woman anymore. Of course, none of those treatments worked. The only treatment that reliably allows trans people to function is transition. And many doctors, I guess, were initially worried that um, folks would come to regret that decision. However, study after study have shown that gender affirming care has a far lower regret rate than virtually any other procedure. Amazing. Thank you, Julia Serrano. She's so correct. She's so right. So yeah, doctors have been moving toward this model of, of affirmative care. Trans children have always existed. Indeed, most trans adults can tell you about their trans childhoods. Some trans kids did socially transition during the 20th century. However, most had their gender identities not affirmed, disaffirmed, subjected them to conversion therapy, and etc. There was a sort of belief at the time that you could change gender identity, like the idea that it was flexible and it was subject to change in your childhood. Uh, but we see now, through this study on uh, from 1997 and this other study from 2004, that that is not the case, that kids do understand their gender identity at a rather young age. Yeah, so we've moved toward the gender affirmative model rather than gender disaffirmative model. It's just recentering things, bringing things away from, you know, shame and coercion and bringing it to like a place of exploration and then allowing them to like, if they consistently identify consistently, persistently, and insistently identify as a gender other than the one that they were assigned at birth, then you should respect their identity. You know, if they remain happy in that gender, they may be placed on puberty blockers and in order to make uh, an informed decision. Gender affirming surgeries typically take place after the hormone therapy stage and often in adulthood. A more thorough review of this model and the rationale behind it can be found here for a detailed account of gender affirming. And Julia starts to outline the moral panic, which we cover on this channel quite a lot. The idea that kids are being transitioned by their parents or that they are being tricked into it or coerced into it, or the idea that the parents are being coerced into it by doctors who are catastrophizing that their kids are going to commit suicide. I love how Julia goes in here and is defining gish gallop. So a gish gallop occurs when a debater confronts an opponent with a rapid series of many specious arguments, half-truths, misrepresentations, and outright lies in a short space of time, which makes it impossible for the opponent to refute all of them within the format of a formal debate. Yeah, so it's like, you just say like five crazy things, and each one of those crazy things would in and of itself take 30 minutes to thoroughly debunk, and so you're like, oh my god, how do I get through all this, or how do I choose which point to address? Gish gallops are tricky, tricky, tricky. So in this instance, we have the the gish gallops are, what about shifting sex ratios? Like the idea that there are more female people thinking that they're trans now instead of before it used to be more male people thought that they were trans. The idea of rapid onset gender dysphoria or social contagion, the fear of detransition, the idea that 80% desist, the idea that this is an attempt at con gay conversion or lesbian extinction, the, the debunked theory of autogynephilia, or that this is a matter of grooming. They just have so many different things. They throw out, they're just like trying to see if anything will stick. They don't have to believe any of it. So before we go too much further, I just wanna say, hit the like button if you're enjoying the content consider subscribing and hitting the bell and maybe clicking all notifications to get notifications for the channel. Also consider checking out my brand new merch store, which just launched. There's gonna be a link down in the description. And you can also check out my Patreon where there are some promo deals for patrons if you wanna maybe get a deal on some of your merchandise. So thank you very much for watching the content. Hope you continue to enjoy. So Julia, you know, she starts to outline here that the thing that she is about to address amongst all these gish gallops is that this idea that gender affirming practices, whether it be social transition, pubertal delay, hormone therapy, or surgery, they're acting like these are novel and active interventions which require further scrutiny. 
this framing makes it seem as though the alternative approach, i.e. doing nothing and just letting the kid grow up is like somehow an inherently neutral and less risky option. But of course, doing nothing is actively disaffirming trans kids' genders. And there, you know, we have plenty of research showing the negative impacts of that approach. So here's a passage discussing this. Children not allowed these freedoms by agents within their developmental systems, such as their family, peers, or school, are at later risk for developing a downward cascade of so psychosocial adversities, including depressive symptoms, low life satisfaction, self-harm, isolation, homelessness, incarceration, PTSD, and suicide, suicidal ideation and attempts at suicide. Here's an expansion on that from another study in 2018. Emerging research indicates that children who are not permitted to express their gender freely within their key developmental contexts, including family and school, might be at risk of negative psychosocial outcomes, both in the short term and into adolescence and adulthood, such as low self-esteem, low life satisfaction, poor mental health, lack of adequate housing, post-traumatic stress, and suicidal thoughts and attempts. Canadian research indicates that one of the key areas of distress for trans and gender diverse youth is a lack of parental support. A well-designed provincial survey showed that young people whose gender identities were not strongly supported by their parents face an attempted suicide rate 14 times higher than the peers who are being supported by their parents. So yes, we've just, in all the research, and they, I guess people generally respond to that by going like, Oh, these kids are threatening suicide. You can't let them manipulate you. That's what the psycho gender critical parents say, the psycho gender critical moms in their weird little Facebook groups. They say like, you cannot let your kid hold you hostage to the idea that they might hurt themselves. Like they don't genuinely believe in trans people's inner experiences of distress, I don't think. Like they genuinely believe that we're just being manipulative and melodramatic when we say that we want to die. Julia continues, any article examining gender affirming care that doesn't even attempt to grapple with all of this research demonstrating the very real negative effects that gender disaffirming approaches inflict on trans youth is kind of telling on itself. There is a giant red flag here that the author either didn't bother to properly do the research or m made up their mind beforehand and purposely hid the information. So here Julia dives into the idea that the treatment is irreversible. Uh, the supposedly passive and neutral do nothing approach of for forces trans adolescents into unwanted endogenous puberties. So while anti-trans activists are quick to decry gender affirming pro approaches as being irreversible and involving quote, a lifetime of medicalization, they don't actually ever discuss how restricting gender affirming care results in similar irreversible changes for trans youth which also require them to pay expensive, pay for expensive medical procedures like surgery and hair removal. And that would not have been necessary, of course. We've talked about this a million, million, million times. Consider a cisgender girl who has always been happy with her assigned gender. Then suddenly at the age of nine or 10, just as she enters puberty, her body shows signs of masculinization and doctors confirm that this is due to her body producing testosterone. And for the record, this is not a hypothetical situation for some intersex children. If this child were horrified about those unwanted um, changes and they asked for hormonal intervention, which the doctor confirms would be safe and effective, would you respect that decision and allow her to proceed? Or would you uh, dismiss her wishes on account of her lack of maturity and insist that she just deal with the testosterone until she's 18 and capable of making an adult decision? As with the last example, if this scenario concerns you, but the idea of transgender children being forced to experience unwanted puberties does not, then you clearly value cis bodies and lives over trans ones. So I do think that there is actually a pretty big flaw to this example. And the flaw to this example is that that's an intersex child. Like as soon as they find out that they're intersex, like the world does not treat them like a cisgender person anymore. Like that child, it would not be about her choice. They would just do things to her and change her whether she wanted it or not they would just try to normalize her. It's still in line with the inflicting cisgenderism on a trans kid. They're just gonna inflict cisgenderism on the intersex kid as well. Yeah, the idea that the care is experimental, they insist that this care is new and untested. However, this is not true. She references a ton of research studies here. The experimental label is most regularly levied against puberty blockers, probably because the average person is not familiar with them. However, they've been used to treat precocious puberty since the 1980s and to stave off unwanted endogenous puberties in trans youth since the mid to late 90s. We've been using them for trans youth 
since the 90s as well, not just for precocious puberty in cisgender children. The parents and doctors make all the decisions and they don't even tell the kid they're intersex half the time. Yeah, they're just like, we're gonna do a bunch of stuff to you and not ask what you think about it. We also should address the common claim that gender affirming care is not based on any quote, high quality studies. In actuality, there are many high quality studies with sound methodologies, significant sample sizes, and which are published in well-respected journals. Uh, however, when trans skeptical people argue this, what they really mean is there aren't any randomized control studies, uh, such as ones where neither the doctor nor the patient know whether that person is receiving the medicine or whether they're receiving a placebo. And this is the gold standard for medical trials. However, it's not logistically possible <laughs> in this situation because it would be very obvious soon which ones were on hormones and which ones weren't, obviously. Okay, so there is a good point to be made here about like rapid onset gender dysphoria or the social contagion issue. It's like impossible to address every single issue in a given sit down. What you can say is that if any of this rapid onset gender dysphoria stuff were true, we would expect this to be reflected in recent studies. Like there would be a sharp reduction in the efficacy of gender affirming care if it was just being done as a trend and there would be a reciprocal increase in the rate of regret, but there isn't a reciprocal increase in the rate of regret. There isn't like a, a growing number of regretful cases, which you would naturally see in response to this. A brief timeline of the gender affirmative model for trans youth. In the mid 1990s, doctors in the Netherlands began treating trans adolescents with puberty blockers at the onset of puberty, and they would follow that up with gender affirming hormones around age 16 which came to be known as the Dutch Protocol or the Dutch Model. But during the 2000s then, numerous groups in the US and elsewhere began adopting the Dutch Protocol. In uh, May 2008, NPR ran a two-part series, which was the first mainstream news story about this that Julia can recall. One of the episodes compared and contrasted the reparative slash conversion therapy approach with what we would now call the gender affirmative approach. And in another one, they were discussing the Dutch approach and these news stories are now 15 years old. In 2009, the Endocrine Society published practice guidelines for trans healthcare, which recommend puberty delay, followed by gender affirming hormones for trans adolescents. Subsequently in 2012, the WPATH standard of care version seven expanded its section on trans children and adolescents. They're continuing to validate the Dutch approach, including a section on social transition in early childhood, describing gender reparative and conversion practices as ineffective and unethical. The Dutch have been anti-LGBT for a long time. Well, in this case, it's a positive because they're saying the Dutch model is the model where you provide puberty blockers and then you give cross sex hormones at age 16. Now we don't always stick to that age per se, but like that is considered, you know, if, if you can, if your mom can sign off on you getting a tattoo at age 16, then like your mom should be able to sign off on you getting hormones at age 16, I guess is kind of how that works. It's like by age 16, and in a lot of places in the United States, like you can consent to medical care at age 16 anyway, like most types of medical care in any case. Over the 2000s, as the puberty delay followed by gender affirming hormones was becoming the standard practice, the debate shifted more toward younger children. So the Dutch group was not in favor of any interventions for prepubescent gender dysphoric children. However, other trans health practitioners began advocating for a social transition. I guess even in the Dutch model, they were like, you know, perhaps it's because they consider the social affirmation to be a separate thing from the medical stuff, but they basically didn't, they didn't say you should do social affirmation for young trans kids. It mostly was like, no, you start treating them when they start puberty, essentially. Over the last 10 years, the gender affirmative model has become more accepted than the watchful waiting model because we have an increasing understanding of the psychological harms associated with disaffirming young children. And there's a recognition that this quote, 80% desistance claim was methodologically flawed. And like, just to explain the methodologically flawed comment there, they had a gender clinic where you could take your kid who's having the first inklings of questions about their gender. And then you determine which one of those kids is actually insistent, persistent trans versus which ones just were enjoying pretending to be Captain Hook. That 80% is like how many of those kids who had a, a kind of gender question were found to not be trans. Like sometimes kids do have gender questions and that's why we have the process to help determine which ones are gonna be insistent and persistent with their gender identity. So yeah, you can't claim that this means that 80% of kids who think that they're trans will decide that they're not before they're adults. It's like, no, 
kids who actually think that they are trans, that 20% stick with it. Research substantiates that children who are pre prepubertal and assert an identity of being transgender and gender diverse, they know their gender as clearly and as consistently as their developmentally equivalent peers who identify as cisgender, and they benefit from the same level of social acceptance. It's like, it's pretty easy to just support them. Watchful waiting is based on binary notions of gender in which gender diversity and fluidity is pathologized. In watchful waiting, it is also assumed that notions of gender identity become fixed at a certain age. The approach is also influenced by a group of early studies with validity concerns, methodologic flaws, and limited follow-up on children who identified as TGD and by adolescents did not seek further treatment. Yeah, that's the other thing too, is like there was limited follow-up <laughs> on, on these studies as well. I heard a case of an intersex girl being told she had to take testosterone when the parents and doctors guessed she was a boy and didn't want to accept her opinion on that. Oh my God, it's just horrific what we do to intersex kids. Yeah, Julia Serrano here includes an obligatory list of position statements in support of gender affirming care. You know, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psych Psychiatry, American Adam Academy of Pediatrics, American Medical Association, American Psychiatric Association, American Psychological Association, Endocrine Society, Pediatric Endocrine Society, WPATH Standards of Care. <laughs> These position statements and clinical guidelines are often invoked in an appeal to authority type manner. Anti-trans activists, on the other hand, will insist that all these groups have been, quote, ideologically captured by trans people, which is utterly fanciful. For the record, I do not believe that these organizations are infallible. Obviously, yeah, they've contributed to the marginalization of trans people in the past. But um, the one thing that is undoubtedly true is that all of these organizations are inherently conservative, often to a fault. And the fact that they all support gender affirmative care and condemn gender disaffirming practices is a testament to how much scientific evidence has been amassed over the last three decades. Because these organizations are like, they're not psyched about change. They're not like, hell yeah, let's do things differently. No, they are resistant to change. They're conservative. It takes a lot of evidence to make them change their practices. We have the list of research studies and reviews supporting the current scientific consensus that gender disaffirming approaches are harmful and that gender affirming approaches are beneficial, sorted by year. And like, so, it, you know, I'll try to put a link to this in the doobly-doo. This is an article written by Julia Serrano, but the reason why it's valuable is that she is quoting all of these articles. Like, if you wanted to know what the studies say, she's not just saying that gender-affirming care is effective. She's saying, I, I'm referencing this other study that was done, or several studies that were done in some cases, saying, look, this is what they actually say. They actually say that the gender affirmative model, particularly for trans kids, is useful for their mental health. It's good for them. It's healthy for them. So shout out to Julia Serrano for doing that enormous, enormous legwork. Thank you so much to my patrons and potential future patrons. I especially want to shout out Tiago Nascimento, Mersh Rolvog, Michelle Frateroli, Amanda B, Wellington Marcus, Michelle Winter, Danielle McDonald, Suzanne Maynard, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Past Null Infinity, Jamie Jam, Nova, Elizabeth Bartell, Sojo, Sarah A, Kevin Young, Athiet, Desi Quiche, Liam Hodgson, and Mr. Atheist.